<laughs> of course. Hello and welcome to Talk Gnosis. My name's Deacon Jonathan Stewart. I'm chained by uh, I'm chained. Okay, there's there's a Freudian <laughs> slip. I'm joined <laughs> by my co-host Jason Memel. Hello, Jason. Our first show in 2022. <laughs> These are the chains I wore in life. No, um, <laughs> sorry, vague Christmas reference because we're doing this in January. Um, but yes, hi everybody. This is Jason. Hey, and uh, we're rambling, we're doing bits, but we got a guest. We've got an incredible guest. It's uh, Sasha Chato, <laughs> live from Greece. It's not going to be live when you're watching this. Hi, Sasha. So good Hello. to see you. I haven't even introduced the topic. Hey, this it's a new year, it's a new show. I forget how to do this, folks. I, I don't, you know, I don't know what I'm doing in the first place, right? So, let alone, I, I guess maybe if I don't know what I'm doing and I've forgotten how to do it, that's a good thing. Uh, we are talking about a topic we have meant to do since we started the show, a topic that you probably don't know that much about because it's not big in the Anglo world, but it's getting trendy. And this is uh, the life, the work of Josephine Peloton. He was uh, a writer, a novelist, uh, an, ar an arts curator, sometimes called the first like a curator. Uh, he was an esotericist. Uh, he uh, started a bunch of important uh, esoteric orders. Uh, just a remarkable, and something that's going to really excite Jason and I, something that we talk about privately all the time as well as on the show, uh, the links between art, creativity, spirituality, religion, the occult, and the mystic. We think that they're pretty strong links. Peladon thought so as well. Sasha's here to, to bring us through the, the life and career of this remarkable man. Hello, Sasha. Hello. <laughs> uh, Sasha, before we get to all this good stuff, and Jason, we didn't talk about any shtick before. So uh, we, we have to plug our Patreon. We got to do it at the top of the show. So again, we, we have to uh, leave you staring blankly for anybody watching the YouTube. <laughs> But we don't like doing this, but we got to do it or we'd have to stop doing the show. So we need your financial support. Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can donate for as little as a dollar per piece of media per month. You can put a cap on that if you're worried about us making too much media. We also give media for free. We don't run everything we do through the Patreon. Uh, we don't give you anything extra for signing up for the Patreon except for early access to the shows. We don't want to keep content behind a paywall because we want to spread the gnosis right we want everybody to know about paladon um that said if you if you're already a patron or uh you're thinking about becoming a patron and there's something you want from us like email me it's uh the, the email is is always <laughs> down in our show notes both on youtube and uh, uh, so yeah let, let us know uh you want jason to come over and serenade you we'll arrange it okay uh request you want me to come over and wash your dishes? Fine, I'll do it. <laughs> PayPal.com slash Gnostic for one-time donations. And please, you can help us out. Uh, I know these are tough times financially. You can help us out. Hey, even if you're a patron, <laughs> you can help us out by telling people about the show. Uh, ear to mouth works really well. Sharing the show, putting it on your social media, dropping it into an email to your best bud. All very helpful. Okay, this is over. We're never going to do this again until next show. Now with the, the main event is beginning. <laughs> Sasha, who was Peladon and what is the Peladon project? So um, Peladon is mostly known as this incredibly eccentric Frenchman, um, key figure in the French occult revival, but depending on what you read and who you read and where you read it, um, you may only ever hear about his eccentricity or you may discover that he was also a visionary, incredibly prolific author. Um, the brain behind the Salons de la Rose Croix, which um, were quite recently kind of brought to um, a wider audience through the Guggenheim shows. Um, and he was also a dedicated Rosicrucian who essentially his whole body of work aimed at um, the re regeneration of society through the arts um, and through self-cultivation. Um, however, for a variety of reasons that I'm sure we'll get into later, he was largely forgotten um, at the end of his life. He died in 1918. Um, and since then, he's kind of, he had kind of only pops up in footnotes and various um, uh, sort of inner order material at um, sort of in uh, certain occult circles. 
Um, now, what is the Paladin Project? The Paladin Project is something I've been doing for the last ooh, 12, 13 years, actually, <laughs> at this point. Um, I uh, researched um, Paladin's whole body of work um, for my doctorate. Um, so because the information that I initially came across, um, even in scholarly work, basically dismissed him as a rather insignificant figure and bad uh, novelist. Um, I, and I initially <laughs> believed that as well until I started getting into the work itself. And I started seeing that there was not only was there this incredible cohesion between his um, works, he had like this grand plan that you can actually see the pattern um, of once you get into his work. Um, and so um, what I realized I needed to do for uh, my PhD was to re really go back to the primary sources, read what Peladan had to say for himself um, and bring update the scholarship and bring it into the, well, 21st century, essentially, uh, because there's very little on Peladan in English. And what there was at the time when I started this was misinformed and badly put together and um, not really informed by um, recent esoteric scholarship either. Um, so basically I went uh, right back to the sources and mapped out his whole um, body of work uh, and tried to establish his intentions based on what he had to say for himself. So I, I avoid speculation. And it's in Peladan makes that really easy, actually, because um, he tells you what he means in several different ways, just to, because he was so sick of being misunderstood within his lifetime. Uh, so there's plenty of uh, quotes uh, from the man himself to kind of go on, and there, there is a coherence to them. Um, but because, aside from being a scholar, I am also a, a visual artist, and that's actually what drew me to um, studying the history of esotericism in the first place, what I was looking for was when I when I entered kind of um, esoteric scholarship, I was looking to systematize my very kind of patchy understanding of um, esoteric visual vocabularies. And in fact, my first love was and remains alchemy and alchemical symbolism. And it was through that route that I came, to, I ended up studying Paladin. And I probably wouldn't have if I spoke better German because um, I wanted, I actually wanted to go deeper into alchemical symbolism, but my German is, um, I can just about order a coffee. So, but I have good French. And so um, looking at a figure, who turned you, the use of symbolism, uh, of esoteric symbolism in art into a whole movement, and essentially he calls it a religion, um, with exquisitely detailed instructions to artists on how to produce art that can touch the soul, so to speak, um, or as he puts it, um, for, for me was an absolute gift. And um, so I did, I have also produced um, series of uh, drawings and paintings and various experimental projects uh, that kind of um, use Paladin's ideas to explore uh, and explore them, to explore them artistically or to illustrate his concepts uh, or to produce visual narratives um, based on uh, some of his core concepts. So what I call the Peladan project is really both the, the few is really the fusion of both my research and my artistic side. Um, and I'm still striving to balance um, the two really um, to find right now it's still more heavily weighted towards the scholarly side, but that's what it is. We were really eager to sort of dive into his ideas, his cosmologies, his advice for artists, his uh, um, insights into the universe. But but I guess we we need to know the man a little bit better first. Could you could you tell us a, a little bit about his his early life and how he got interested in religion and mysticism? Yep. So I mean, from the cradle, quite honestly, because um, Paladin's father an incredibly interesting figure. If you read some of the early biographies, of course, they describe him as the complete madman, but then what genius isn't um, mad? <laughs> um, 
So uh, Peladan's father was very deeply um, steeped, really, in various occult and mystical and, um, uh, quite frankly, some quite odd um, movements uh, in the sort of early to mid um, 19th century. And we really, to understand Paladin and his background, we really need to remember this is the century in which France throws out religion. Okay. And it's a time of incredibly large shift, social shifts, um, where so religion is essentially uh, demoted, Many, um, hundreds of churches closed, clergy actually prosecuted, and all of this leaves a social gap in which all sorts of, you know, all sorts of things started to flower. And among, um, within that context, you've got uh, people who are desperate to salvage um, whatever they had before, who are fervently Catholic, who are um, very strong believers in various kind of uh, religious streams, and they want to find ways to save it. So Peladan's father is one such, and just one of the many things um, that he did was to run a kind of salon at his home in Lyon, where um, he gathered all sorts of interesting intellectuals and uh, poets and artists and religious figures. Um, and they, they would discuss various topics, both political and religious and mystical and so on. And the young Josephine Peladin um, would pour wine at these salons. So he literally grew up within that atmosphere. Um, listening to, uh, you know, if you can imagine a four, five, six year old boy, as he himself tells it, um, sitting on the knee of some poet or bishop and listening and actually participating in the conversations uh, going on there. And um, following, the, uh, following that, um, when Paladin was eventually at uh, the age to go to school, he managed to get himself expelled from every single school in the region because he kept arguing um, religion <laughs> and <laughs> with his teachers. And he would literally just, so he, I mean, he was precocious, obviously, um, argumentative, opinionated, which is all good. Um, and by 1872, you see, so by the time he was 14, um, he'd managed to get himself expelled from every single sec secondary school there was. So his father just kind of um, said, OK, well, you can teach yourself. You don't actually need school. And his father prescribed a course of study that included a self-educational method that was popular at the time. Um, but then he also handed him uh, Fabre d'Olivet's um, uh, The True Words of Pythagoras and... Um, several other books of that sort. So you've got the young Peladan uh, in his early teens kind of reading um, philosophical histories uh, of the origin of mankind and, and, and world mythology as much as was understood at the time. And by the time in that he's in his late teens, he's, he's reading Agrippa, he's reading staples, occult staples, uh, you see. Um, so from the cradle. <laughs> <laughs> um what was his his connection to the art world and, and what was the salon Roy Crow? So um after that really unconventional childhood, um in 1880, um and he his interest developed before that through the influence of his father and brother and the salons at his father's his parents' home. Um, but in 1880, Paladin goes off to Italy and it's almost a pilgrimage for him. This is his coming of age sort of thing. And he uh, visited Rome and Pisa and Florence and sees, you know, the you know, sort of amazing art and sculpture um, there. And this seems to have been the main source of his lifelong appreciation of Renaissance art. For him, Renaissance art and mannerism becomes a touchstone of what art really should all be about. And the um, 
allegorical use of mythological figures and characters and symbols and so forth, because we have that incredible flowering, especially in mannerism, I would say. Um, and this then inspired uh, one of his first publications, um, an essay on Rembrandt specifically. And after that, um, Peladin returns to France and goes off to Paris to become a writer. But um, his father didn't have much money to send him. His father established uh, periodical after periodical. Generally, uh, this was an incredible time for the press, for, for the printed press, um, sort of the earlier, early mass media. Um, and um, Peladan had to get uh, initially a very boring office job, which he absolutely despised. This was not somebody who could easily fit in a kind of in, in, into that kind of context. So he began writing to make a living. Um, and he was since he'd already had such a sort of unconventional um, well, lack of formal education. He audited courses in art history and in what was then called Chaldean, Chaldean history um, at, in, in Paris and at the uh, Louvre. Uh, the, the Louvre actually run courses in this because remember this is the time when the archaeological discoveries of ancient Assyrian civilization were literally just arriving in France. Um, and this had an immense impact on Peladan's work. Um, and so Peladan began working as an art critic, writing reviews for journals and newspapers and so on. And he eventually established himself um, by his, he, he had an especially sharp pen, um, challenging academic understandings of art um, and to the degree that he actually became um, the annual salons absolutely dreaded his reviews um, and, to, and at, at some point he actually had to disguise himself uh, to, for them to let him in, used a faked identity um, and wrote um, very, very harsh critiques of, of impressionist art, anything that really was art without a deeper meaning. That's what made Paladin angry. Um, he had this deep, deep, and uh, from so early on, this deep, deep sense that art had to mean something and had to be focused on promoting um, spiritual development, spiritual um, growth, you see. Um, so he considered that art that was simply a reproduction, even if it was a beautiful reproduction, was completely pointless. Uh, in fact, he called it, um, he says, uh, I have a lovely quote, contemporary painting crawls behind art, just like journalism, which is a monkey's tail of literature. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's all up for you. Um, I understand that, that, that you are actually doing a course on Peladon. Um, I'm going to say his name different every time I say it, by the way, with a different <laughs> fake, fake accent, a different fake way of saying his name. But could you tell us about this course? So, um, yeah, I was, I was, I have to admit, I was hesitant at first um, because this is quite a new way of um, going at his material for me. But I had a lot of requests and I figured, you know, no time like the present. So um, Peladan, and we'll get into perhaps the uh, sort of found, the, the, the kind of deeper foundations of this later. Among his many um, activities, he established um, a, a system for self-initiation. Paladin uh, really went against the tide of his time, but even perhaps um, for our time, it's uh, quite surprising. Um, he went against the tide of the of established and structured um, orders or es esoteric orders of any sort, and completely threw secrecy out the window. And what he did instead was he created a series of six plus one, essentially, handbooks for self-initiation. And one was directed at men, one was directed at women, one was directed at artists. The other three plus one essentially elaborate and go into the sort of more advanced philosophical implications of what he presents as a system for self-development, very sort of carefully staged um, and structured system. The whole point being that this is something that one works through on one's own 
and applies to one's everyday life. So rather than um, his esoteric system for self-development being something that you do in a lodge setting um, and progressing through degrees with formalized initiations and rituals and so forth. This was exactly the opposite. It's something that is done, it's um, uh, careful inner work in relating to how you go about your life in society and as a member of uh, the human race, essentially, and as a member of society. Um, and he put this out there in plain sight. Um, anybody could just pick up the book uh, and read it, but it would only make total sense if you then also read his uh, novels in which he actually illustrates how <laughs> this can be done and how it goes wrong. So it's, it's, it's a code, you see. It's, it, it's incredible. He encodes um, the actual sort of the deeper part of um, the deeper elements in literature, in literary form. Um, but then he gives you a handbook to follow if you're OK with just doing that. So what's my course Is... about? Um, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was just, I, uh, I'll let you finish what you're saying the course is about, because I think that's actually more important, but I, I can hang on to my question. All right. Well, that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, well, because it's a tremendous amount of material. Um, I mean, the handbook for um, young men alone is some 400 something pages. Um, what I've done is I've distilled all that into um, the basics. And this call, and because Paladin structured his system around, so the neophyte stages is a, is a seven step process. And then that, that's followed by what you could call the second degree, but he doesn't call it that. I'm just calling it that for reference. Um, you then have a 12 step more advanced process. And then you have a final triad, which you could understand as a third sort of level. Um, and I've distilled all of this into six plus one workshops, which is going to be tight but doable. And in each workshop, we're going to be looking at one of the books. Um, and essentially, I'll be giving participants excerpts and a distillation of the content of that first stage. We're only looking at the septenaries at the first stage because there simply isn't time to do all of it and it does need time to work through and digest really and engage with. Um, and the idea is this is going to be uh, interactive. Participants are going to get the chance to work with this. If they want to work with it as pra esoteric practitioners, they can do that. I remain in my seat as scholar okay I, i'm not this i'm not an esoteric teacher i don't want to be an esoteric teacher <laughs> I'm a scholar as an artist let me put that on record please um however you're not, you're not guaranteeing enlightenment with the course for instance i can't and i can't and no, neither can paladin because he and you know what if anybody takes this material and then claims to be offering initiations they're lying and they're lying because Paladin himself says divest yourself of mentors and leaders. OK, mm -hmm. he's the one who says, you know, that this system cannot be used that way. So if it's being used that way, it's already a distortion of what he set out to make it. Um, therefore, I'm very happily in my seat as scholar. And all I'm doing is translating it and offering it in a format which is accessible um, and will make it possible for participants to get to grips with the concepts and the material. Now, if uh, and the reason I say this course is kind of um, it's, it's quite unique in that it, I call it a hybrid course. Scholars can participate and come away with a deep understanding of the philosophical elements um, at play here. Uh, and they can also get the opportunity in the interactive segment of the workshops to hear from practitioners and to see what it's like to work with this material for oneself as well. So um, I think that could be a very unique exchange um, with the potential really to break down a lot of barriers and perhaps even misunderstandings. Um, because I've been in a lot of discussions lately with this sort of whole scholar practitioner thing and it really um you know there, there should be no um conflict there to my mind mm -hmm. anyway 
Um, so scholars will come away with a much clearer understanding of the philosophies involved in the context. Practitioners will get exactly that too, but they also get the opportunity, and that's why it's in a workshop format, to work with the material, because there will also be guided discussion points and guided activities if they, and these are optional, but for people who want to do them, there will be a segment where there's group work and then everybody comes back into the main group and can feed back and really get into the material and uh, as in terms of how it could impact their own life, where they see challenges um, and so on and so forth. And then for artists, of course, there's this, which is what I've discovered for myself, this rich, rich um, ground for inspiration. I mean, it's endless. Uh, so from the idea, the philosophical ideas alone, you can just take any one of them and run uh, with them um, for <laughs> in terms of artistic inspiration. So that's the course and it's starting on February 15th, this coming February 15th, it'll run weekly uh, on Zoom um, and it, it will be recorded. So uh, if time zones or work or other commitments are issues, then um, people can uh, simply sign up for the course and then watch it in uh, retrospect and to replace the um, sort of interactive part if people can't participate live we will also have a dedicated Facebook group set up where we can kind of do that in slow motion um, to offer all the support but as I say the interactive part is um, optional um, although my feeling is it will really enrich um, the experience for those who choose to do it. Um, and it will run for six weeks. The initial introductory lecture will go out ahead of the, the rest of the course. I'm actually recording that next week. Um, and that will just set the, set the scene, the context and explain some of the sort of uh, elements, the rest of the elements of the course. And my hope is that eventually we'll be able to get to stage two but that depends also on interest and my own availability so um and so for those who would like to know more about it you can visit treadwells-london.com slash events or just go to the events tab and um or just type my name or the name peladan into the search feature and it'll pop up the course um, also, for those wishing to take it, there is, um, there's a bundle offer with the course I ran last year, the Introduction to the Academic Study of Western East Terrorism, and um, Treadwells are offering the full set of 12 recordings together with the Peladan course at um, a, disc a major discount, actually, for those who would like a deeper understanding of sort of esoteric history and the context um, the context involved but that's again that's an optional add-on so that's <laughs> more or less what that's all about <laughs> very cool uh, so jason um, you had a question i've got like three questions there's a bunch of really cool stuff there um uh and uh a couple of these aren't on the list that you've already seen uh sasha um the 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 first thing was when you were mentioning how the the the, the course that he, when he was initially uh, releasing it, he was saying like, this is just for anybody, but that, was it clear that you needed to read the books to understand them? Or is this almost like Peladan being almost accidentally esoteric? No, he makes it clear because he quotes okay. himself. He cross <laughs> um, he cross references himself all the time. So when you kind of you turn to let's say in the Septenary for Neophytes and you turn to stage three, whatever, and it starts with a quote from one of his novels. <laughs> and that is meant to illustrate precisely what he's getting at. And the poor guy, he got so tired of being misunderstood, but because that was work, right? I mean, it sounds like hard work to us now. Imagine it, it sounded like hard work to them then. Um, and he, he, poor guy at one point actually released an anthology in which he tried to explain the concordances between the one series of books, the esoteric handbooks and the literature. And then he took to actually publishing a little appendix of concordances of this sort in some of his later books because he was he, he was throwing the information at people and still <laughs> they didn't get it. So yeah, it's not he's not he's trying to not be esoteric. <laughs> <laughs> it's a 
You know, I'm actually getting a vibe of uh, Aleister Crowley because it feels like so much of Aleister Crowley's writing is him trying to explain himself again and again and again. <laughs> you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm this is what I'm about to say is going to be incredibly unpopular, but I wish people <laughs> would just look at the OTO layman and then look at the layman of Peladan's order because ah. Crowley did a fantastic job of lifting Peladan's ideas of monthly. <laughs> And uh, of then making sure that Paladin's name was completely erased. Okay. Nice. So um, now we know this goes on throughout sort of, uh, you know, occult circles. This is a thing. We know it. All right. Mm -hmm. But I know, I know that you also have questions about, well, why has Paladin kind of been forgotten? Well, since you mentioned Crowley. <laughs> <laughs> there you so, go. Yeah. Uh, there you go. And the design, by the way, for that layman is Peladan's own. Yeah. Wow. Just, just wow. for the record, he commissioned it. He didn't draw it, but it is his design. And the symbolism mm. relates to elements of his um, worldview. So. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, John, did you have a thing you wanted to ask? Oh, yeah, I did. I was wondering if you could share with us with you know, one or two, you, not too many spoilers, but I'm very curious about, uh, degree is not the right word, but the neophyte level. Like, what is he telling people to do? Is there instructions to be like, you know, get up at 6 a.m. and pray, or you need to go out and paint, or, or you know, do this ritual? Like, what, what is the kind of the praxis? Like, what is, can you give us any examples of, of praxis that he's recommending to people? So, um, the, you know, <laughs> you know, this promises to be deeply unpopular because he asks for a lot of work. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's not get up at 6 a.m. and pray necessarily. It, the, the, you know, you're told to pray when you realize you need to because you're going to realize you need to, um, in a sense. Um, uh, it's not actually prayer. It's closer to, I think, a form of, it, of contemplation, I would call it philosophical contemplation, a la Plato, perhaps, or a la Socrates. Mm. It's in that form. Um, he begins um, by, te and it's it's actually called septenary, of, I'm, 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 I'm thinking of the first one, which is how to become a mage, which has been massively misinterpreted, but anyway. Um, <laughs> is septenary for exiting the century and it's literally it starts with how to divest yourself of i'm going to call it the the, the chains since we started the conversation with chains, <laughs> that society has kind of wrapped you with and the social niceties and the con conforming to social mores um that essentially make you lose your soul mm -hmm. so, so, um, and he gets into, I mean, it's incredible, actually. He gets into, some of it has dated, um, but a lot of it hasn't. And and it literally has to do with, um, he looks at morals, he looks at ethics, he looks at getting into daily routines that essentially make you forget your, your reason for, you know, make you lose the will to live, which is a, a very modern phrase. Mm -hmm. Um and he tells he has a lot of detail on what kind of company you shouldn't keep on when addressing men um on how to approach women and what kind of women to avoid now poor peladan is often labeled a misogynist um but that's a complete misreading um of actually what he's actually saying if you put it into if you if you kind of transplant some of the quotes into modern terminology it sounds like it's misogynistic but honestly the man's a proto-feminist because if you then see his system for young, for women i say young uh, for the young men one he's actually he specifies because some people have misunderstood this he says this is the book i wish i'd had when i was 20. Mm. And i'm writing this for you young man who are now 20. okay he actually says that and for women, he's largely, again, I think, speaking to unmarried young women. Um, and he actually laments the uh, state in which women find themselves. And he says, you know, from, the, from boarding school to the nunnery to the drawing room, women are never free. And they can never have their own voice and they can never express themselves and they're tied up in corsets. So, uh, you know, when the man's and and he kind of sets up this ideal feminine, the uh, ideal uh, feminine, really, um, archetype 
of princesses of ancient myth and ancient his history, in fact, historical figures as well, goddesses of ancient myth. And he holds these up as the ideals that women should aspire to. So um, now how to get there, it starts by breaking all the rules. You need to become an anarchist. <laughs> it's, it's counterculture before counterculture. Um, but it's systematized. And what he beautifully does is he blends it with a number of known esoteric systems. So you've got um, a set of concordances right at the top of each step of the, of the septenaries and then the dodecanaire, as he calls it, the 12th step, the second one, where he connects it to um, the sephir, the Kabbalistic Sephiroth, and he connects it to Sheldian deities and um, a number, and to the Catholic, um, um, what's the word, uh, not lit liturgy, um, sacraments, thank you. Uh, so, well, you've got baptism and you've got um, acts, you know, acts of charity, and each one is connected to these things. And he explains he's doing this because he acknowledges there is no one way up the mountain. So if somebody is of a personality mm. and he gives a lot of de detailed depth, he bases it on astrological, but not Astro so not astrological as in your personal star sign, but on your personality type as it's expressed by specific zodiac signs, if that makes sense mm -hmm. to you. So um, he says that so if you're a Solarian type, or you're a, a sun type, um, then you're going to have these and these and these characteristics and you're going to have these, these and these weaknesses. Therefore, you need to work on X or Y in order to balance them. Um, and he, so he suggests different approaches depending on your personality type as well and where you might find more challenges depending again um, on those characteristics. And he, he also acknowledges, you know, for some individuals, the best way is going to be through pure reason, through intellectualism alone. For some, it's going to be through art and for some, it's going to be through prayer. And neither is neither path is better than the others. It just depends on what kind of person you are. You see. Oh, that's so interesting. Like it a very is. responsive system in a way. It's uh, a very, very adaptable. It's Jungian before Jung. It's the big five personality types before the big five personality types. Um, um, it's incredible. And it, the and I say Jungian because the ultimate aim of all this is he says absolute freedom of the soul, absolute. Folk, uh, conscious self-determination, self-actualization, which of course, you know, we get with Jung. And it may be, they may well have drunk from the same cup. I don't know if Jung even knew of Paladin, but he certainly, there were certainly um, common uh, people in common and streams of currents of thought in common. I was never able to establish a clear connection. I tried. Um, yeah. So, I mean, if you just put their reading lists next to each other. <laughs> <laughs> like what they both were reading, you know? Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. But uh, but then, you know, if you get into the more specific nitty gritty, you know, there's a connection through mm -hmm. Henri Bergson, for example, yep. who also influences Jung, but then Paladin knew his, I think it's his, either his wife or his sister in Paris. Did the two meet? Again, I wasn't able to establish this for certain. It's very possible, though. So you <laughs> see, you have um, lines of um, transmission of that sort. And so Peladan's system, you know, I don't want to uproot it from its context. I really don't want to do that. That's not my job. Um, and I think he deserves to be known for it first. And then if somebody wants to take it and simplify it later, that's their problem. But um, it's, you could take it out of the French occult revival context and it would be a great system for living, you know, for a kind of self, uh, you know, um, divest yourself of all the pressures that society kind of puts on you. Um, mm. It's very much about freedom. It's very Promethean. It's very Luciferian, mm. I have to say. <laughs> <laughs> um, so there was something that you mentioned there earlier about the notion of like uh, within his course about chains, like and divesting yourself of those chains. And like, I'm always, I feel like I'm always kind of the person on the show going like, but is it Gnostic? And generally the answer is yes, but, but like to answer the question of is it Gnostic is like the, the this is a speculation question. So this is not, did Peladon say this, uh, but maybe more your own sense or riff 
on, um, and I know also that Gnosticism itself can be kind of a can, um, a broad term, <laughs> hard <laughs> to apply, but that like, could a connection be made to Gnosis in the sense of a connection to the divine, uh, a non, non uh, um, like it cannot be delivered, it can only be found. Like someone can't give you Gnosis, you have to, you have to experience it. Um, and the artistic process, the the process of creating art, of presenting art, um, if that is can if, if that would be, if there's a through line there conceptually between uh, mm -hmm. the impact of art as Paladon saw it and Gnosis as Gnostics umbrella term see it. Mm, okay, I can't do umbrella terms because uh, <laughs> fair enough. The scholar, the scholar in me is jumping up and down, crying. <laughs> Which meaning of Gnostic are we using here? Um, and you kind of specified gnosis, which I'm I'm okay with, mm -hmm. but. Um, I need to clarify because a lot of people seem to get this confused. Um, Paladin was by no means anti-materialist, by no means. Um, and there is a quote which I don't have uh, off the top of my head, but it's along the lines of, um, you know, we're in this plane, we're in this field, it's here for a reason, right here, right now is the right place. And it's within this mortal lifespan that that uh, while we're still breathing bags of meat, that we mm -hmm. can actually achieve um, that reintegration in this life, not in the afterlife, not in the next mm -hmm. life, in this life. Um, and so, so, yeah. Yeah. Well, like, so this is maybe me. Um, you were saying earlier something you said might be unpopular. This might be me saying something unpopular. But like, mm -hmm. I feel like the anti materialist stance of some Gnosticism is actually a second order effect of an experience of Gnosis. Um, that like you have a divine experience or you have an experience of something much bigger than you. And then often the question is, but why don't I get to feel that all the time? Well, that must mean that there's something wrong with the world. Um, mm -hmm. And then there, and then you know, there's like the the cultural process you're in helps uh, affect the the later conclusions you come to. But for me, I don't necessarily see Gnosticism or Gnosis as having to require anti-materialism. It's more about that that moment of connection to something often that maybe you were already connected to but didn't know until you had that experience. Um, uh, I'm, this is me reaching, but it's also me as an artist. Like I, I'm a theater maker, and I, I've often found that like my my connection to Gnosticism was it was the only kind of spirituality I'd found that that in any way addressed what it was like for me to create work. Mm, um, okay. I and get it. that's kind of my way into Paladin there. I get it. You see, what the the dissonance for me is the scholarly definitions of Gnosticism. Um, mm -hmm. Three of them, if I'm not, or two and two and one less popular one, which is you know all about the the historical Gnostics. Of course, and the anti materialism there. You see, that's where the um, I have issues with the term. But in terms of what you're describing, absolutely yes, that is the way into Paladin and. The thing to understand here is, and I, I loved your the way you put that about um, once you have that experience, kind of thinking, well, there must be something wrong with the world. There is something wrong with the world. And Paladin um, goes to huge lengths to work that out. And this is one of the oldest philosophical questions we have, um, which is sort of the problem of evil and why bad things happen to good people. And... Um, you know, are we dealing with an evil or an angry god? Are we dealing with um, an access, a cosmic accident? What are we dealing with? And um, so Paladin's theodicy, which is the sort of the philosophical judgment of God um, in order <laughs> to try to understand why evil even exists and what its nature is and what we can how we can even address it this is really at the heart of his cosmology you see because um and once he sorts that out philosophically and i'll get to the content of it um then everything else flows from that with paladin and you're absolutely right that art is um the way through it and so um, I don't know if, if uh, I might as well segue into that part, um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which it, so um, Paladin followed Fabre d'Olivet in um, revisiting 
because what Fabre d'Olivier did was essentially he claimed that the scriptures had become badly corrupted through successive mistranslations. He's, he wasn't, he's not 100% wrong, actually. Um, <laughs> it's true of the Hermetica as well. The, the, the way a lot of ancient texts um, that have been translated, either from Greek or from Hebrew or from Aramaic or from whatever, the, the way they've, they've kind of been translated and retranslated um, within a different cultural and temporal context has also impacted the actual meanings that are transmitted. So by the time we're reading it in English, we're not actually reading what was written originally. And mm -hmm. um, Fabre d'Olivier really ran with this and came up with a complete reinterpretation and rewriting of the book of Genesis um, in order to, and not, and not only the book of Genesis, other parts of the scriptures as well, in order to address the same problem, but Fabre d'Olivier was coming at it from a somewhat different angle and for uh, impact, influenced by different cultural processes. The idea of being able to do that and the idea of some of the older meanings or possible symbolic meanings encoded into Genesis really gripped Paladin. So although he didn't agree with everything that Fabre d'Olivier said, he borrowed the process and he rewrote Genesis from the beginning himself <laughs> and as Peladan would have it you see um and here's here's the secret of art um as Peladan has it one day God orders the angels to create beings in their own shadow and it's not God who creates humanity at all it's the angels um, and what the angels do uh, is they actually draw um, the, the silhouette, they draw the outline of their own shadows and then um, breathe life into this drawing. And that drawing, this made of angelic shadows, becomes the first androgynous human. Mm -hmm. And the angels fall completely in love with this creation of theirs. So this is the first act of of of, of, of making art. Okay, um, this is the first act of making art. But this creature that they've created, this androgyne that they've created and fallen in love with now, is made of the stuff of angelic shadows. The substance is different. It's like you know you have a a, a glass um, vessel or a ceramic vessel, say, and a plastic vessel. And if you go to pour boiling water into a plastic vessel, well, what's going to happen is going to melt or something. Mm -hmm. um, so because they fall in love with their creation, the angels um, want to share the divine mysteries and divine glory with them. So, they, you know, they get over enthusiastic, essentially. And this creates the fall, not because it's evil, not because it's an act of pride, none of that. But simple physics, says Paladin, simple natural law, this creature made of angelic shadows cannot hold those mysteries. You know, boiling water, plastic vessel, best way I can put it. Um, and so the only way to save this creature, it has to be saved because it's made of angelic breath, is to put it into a material context, subject it to temporality, and as that ha and in that way, in the flesh form, it, it is able to gradually, uh, and th this is why temporality matters, gradually work towards discovering those mysteries and holding them. Throw them at all together, it'll just disintegrate. G give humans the chance to work towards it, and they can reach the same point. However, mm. so humans are then placed in matter and the androgyne becomes two because you need, well, there's various reasons according to Paladin. So the androgyne is separated into two and he's following Plato's symposium at this point, okay? Because basically at Paladin's heart is Plato, a lot mm -hmm. of Plato. Um, <laughs> Plato is so unpopular for all the wrong reasons among occultists, but Paladin is pure Plato to a great degree. <laughs> Um, and so men and women land on Earth, but oh dear, right now they're like children, they're like infants. They can't possibly begin this process of discovering the divine mysteries unless they're given guides. So guess what? The angels are thrown after them. 
mm. given material form and told, you need to stay here until this lot grow up and you need to help them grow up. <laughs> and the only way for, the, for humans to grow up, apparently, is to create. Because in creating, they are emulating their creators. And in so doing, they become aware of who they are in the Orphic sense, in the sense of knowing one's divine origins. And mm. o only once that has occurred coll collectively and a critical mass has been reached, um, you know, will, will humanity be able not only to reintegrate themselves, but to free those poor angels who've been stuck here looking after us since however, <laughs> how, whenever. And um, not and not only that, and yes, and the uh, according to Peladan once again, the angels themselves are the um, many sort of um, the divinities of ancient um, uh, pantheons or great sort of leading lights um, of human history. As far as Peladan con is concerned, um, those are the angels under different guises for different cultures at different times. Uh, and they have left the secrets we need to follow encoded in the ancient monument, the mon monuments of the ancient world um, mm -hmm. in symbolic form so that those um, that secrets are never lost. And as um, we are inspired to create and evolve uh, spiritually and awaken spiritually, essentially, um, eventually we'll get back upstairs. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is the cosmology so back to your question about artists i'm sorry that was such a detour but <laughs> no no i loved it t tell me how to do it in a shorter way and I will. <laughs> um you know color down to hundreds of pages to do this um um as far as artists are concerned, <laughs> Pella Dan says artists those who um those who truly do sort of seem to have been born with some talent or for whom that is the only mode of existence that they can even bear to live with um you know you, I, i'm sure you and many listeners know precisely the feeling of you can't be you unless you're creating um it, you know it's the people who are really driven by that in a sense um they peladan says are the offspring of the angels themselves and he mm -hmm. believed himself to be um one of them too so it doesn't matter what kind of art of course not just visual art all the arts mm -hmm. um and so he says they are a special breed and it is to the artists that peladan then calls and says you're the only ones who can you know you've been born with the ability to reach out and see uh, and then here we come to the gnosis you're asking about mm -hmm. um and therefore it is your sacred duty to bring it into material form so that you can wake up everybody else. And that's what the Salons de Rosgroa were about. That was the purpose of those Salons. It was Paladin's attempt at literally bombarding an unsuspecting public with symbolic <laughs> art containing hidden messages that he thought would kickstart them into uh, a Gnostic, or as you, uh, your use of Gnostic awakening. That's, mm. That was the idea. It, for Paladin, it failed. He was very disillusioned by that effort but that was the idea yeah mm. and for uh and you know this this could be a whole other show and maybe we'll do it maybe we'll do it with you but i i think there, there's a couple of things there to, to go back to the earlier conversation about gnosis and narcissism but you, you know peloton has a uh a pre-human fall um he's drawing heavily from plato he's rewriting genesis he has the importance of gnosis and also he um doesn't like the world system right it may not be, be materiality but you mentioned society the world system which we could perhaps just call the world um which we have to break <laughs> free from so i so he may not be a gnostic by the academic definitions of a Sethian, not not that um, many uh, academics even use that term anymore in ancient gnostic um but the He's. We're seeing some themes that I think maybe some hardcore adherents of Gnosticism uh, who are watching the show may feel like this. This person is our brethren. Um, but but talking about uh, uh, the movements, going back to his life, because uh, I want to ask. And Sam, I know that you're watching, so th this question's for you. What's the Kabbalistic order of the Rose Cross? Why did Hel Paladin help found it, and then why did he leave? Okay. 
So we pick up the thread of Peladan, young Peladan in Paris, and he has already planned his book series, okay, at this point, or he started planning it. This man, he, he, he planned and then he did, and interestingly, he did most of what he planned. Um, he wrote, he publishes his first novel, um, La Vie Suprême, in 1884, um, and it was a great success, and it was, it led to a young man writing to him, begging Peladan to become his mentor. That young man was Stanislas de Gaeta. Um, and it was under Peladan's tutelage and guidance that de Gaeta quickly discovers classic esoteric texts that we would recognize today. And de Gaeta really runs with the idea and wants to start esoteric groups and create a college of mages. And this is, this is from his correspondence. Okay, so um, through the next two or three years, the two men become fast friends and Peladan comes to call him brother initiates him into his um, particular brand of Rosicrucianism, which we'll get to. Um, and as Paladin and De Gaeta are developing their occult circles, um, De Gaeta more than Paladin. Paladin uh, was kind of dragged into things by De Gaeta a lot of the time. Um, they become acquainted with Papus. Um, and Papus has his grand vision of uniting all the occult orders into one system of esoteric studies. This was very much a theme at the time. And again, I'll sort of remind everyone of the context. This is a country where the politics since the French Revolution have gone in a direction where secularism, laicite, is the order of the day. That leaves a gap, Pub the idea of public worship, the idea of some kind of connection to, uh, you know, anything beyond the material uh, is suddenly not being represented. And so you've got all these groups springing up in order to try to address that uh, gap, that vacuum. Um, and so this impulse with the French occult revival and the impulse with Papus, and you also get it with the Theosophical Society, this uh, attempt to unite all of this form of knowledge um, under one umbrella. And of course, it comes with very good intentions and usually ends badly, mm -hmm. <sighs> historically at least. So, um, in influenced by all of this, uh, Papus creates his independent, sort of his Ecole Hermetique, as it came to be known, School of Esoteric Studies, and in 1888, de Gaeta with Paladin for, found this or, Kabbalistic order of the Rose Cross. And originally it draws on Peladan's Rosicrucian lineage as well. Um, but this turned sour very quickly. And it turned sour because Peladan really did not want um, did, uh, it, it, it didn't suit his temperament, it didn't suit his beliefs either, the idea of a closed and structured school or order. It's simply, you know, this is the guy who got expelled from however many schools, right? He didn't do closed systems. He didn't do regimentation and he absolutely bridled at the idea of um, demanding uh, or, or, or of demanding obedience of somebody who was supposed to be freeing their own soul. So he really didn't do hierarchy in, in that sense. Um, and so it, this turned into a, a very public quarrel and rift between Paladin and the rest of them. Um, and some of this was actually published in the sort of, can you imagine an, an occult quarrel? We see them on Facebook groups nowadays, but on sort of in daily national newspapers can you actually picture in, in 1891 or can you actually picture that um and so this very public quarrel because papus and de Gaeta's, um movements meanwhile had acquired a very sort of good reputation sort of high profile status and this was social capital this was not something they wanted to lose because of this quarrel um and uh, so this fiasco went on for several years caused a lot of confusion and misunderstandings 
Um, and the Rosqua Kabbalistic kind of, it didn't die in the water. Peladan simply walked off and created his own order as he'd imagined it from the beginning um, and carried on. He didn't, um, I believe he corresponded with De Gaeta once, but De Gaeta died very young. Um, and then, um, but Peladan maintained and publicly maintained his respect for Papus throughout and grieved his death. Uh, it took it very hard. So um, that, it was, it was called the War of the Roses in the press at the time. And really it is based on the ideological and philosophical differences, partly to do with the idea of closed and secret orders as opposed to Peladan's much freer system but which is hard in itself to penetrate. Uh, that's what the courses have helped. Um, and secondly, personal um, conflicts as well. There was a lot of animosity with specific figures surrounding Papus and Degaita. Oswald Worth absolutely hated Aladdin. Um Santi Del Vedra, who was uh, promoting the idea, and well, Papus uh, as well, promoting the idea of synarchic rule. Peladan didn't that didn't like that either. Um, and so there are claims I've seen scholarship claiming that Peladan actually supported um, a form of synarchy. It's a lot more nuanced than that. Now this isn't probably isn't the time to get into it. But um, those two figures were really red rags <laughs> to Peladan, and that's basically how he left. And then he establishes his new order um, and explains it by saying, "I refuse to rub shoulders with spiritual masonry or Buddhism," um, and. His new order focuses exclusively on his brand of Rosicrucianism, which again, that needs specifying, and uh, the promotion of uh, art of his aesthetic as esoteric vision, yeah. essentially. Can you can you tell us about his version of Rosicrucianism and this, this Rosicrucian lineage that you mentioned? Uh, Jason's already rolling his eyes. He hates lineage talk. He's, he's going to go for a walk or go feed his cash. <laughs> I'm <laughs> fine with it. I find it, I think it's fascinating. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, if, if it's any comfort, Peladan rolled his eyes at lineage talk as well. He did uh, designate successors kind of because he had to, um, because he, he, he had to, because um, he had, uh, he felt he'd failed towards the end of his life and hoped that, um, that he, that he'd failed due to character flaws and that others who were perhaps more diplomatic and more able to would be able to promote these ideas perhaps in a better way. So what was um, his uh, lineage? Um, Paladin was, in, was um, initiated into what's called Toulouse Rosicrucians, a Toulouse uh, Rosicrucian circle, whose lineage comes through um, a certain Viscount La Paz. And he is, a lesser known really uh, Rosicrucian figure who himself is thought, but again the evidence is pretty shaky here, to have been initiated by a Prince Balbiani of Palermo who was a follower of Cagliostro, but this is uncertain, okay, so this is not uh, 100%. La Paz was an alchemist, a physician and a diplomat who had this very loose circle around him. So his Rosicrucian order was never really well populated, never very large um, and not at all regimented. Um, and he was very discreet, so we don't have a lot of information, but the key part of his legacy seems to have been that there was a lack of organized initiatory work and this was replaced by the work of the individual. Um, this has been described as, so for example, the free practicing of medicine, uh, offering free, me free um, medical care to those who needed it quietly without making a big fanfare about it. So um, La Paz himself as a physician, so was Peladan's brother, Adrian, um, or for example, organizing the salons as in Peladan's case. So depending on what one's one's individual 
kind of leaning and talents and um, skills took them towards um, doing work for the good of society in other words whatever that work happened to be and this is kind of very much a return to the original Rosicrucian principles which were largely modes of behavior um you know so that the discretion kind of um reflect the, the the discretion that we see certainly with la paz um less so with peladan and he understood later that this had been a mistake um kind of reflects the idea of wearing the habit of the country one finds oneself in and sort of fitting in and working quietly um and the idea of doing good and for the betterment of society but again quietly um so that's the kind of that's what Peladan has received and his interpretation and application of this um is in his own Rosicrucian order um now one element of that was through the salons because as I said the whole idea of the salons for Peladan was let's bombard the uh, the unsuspecting public with art full of hidden occult messages and they can't help but wake up um and the, the same with his uh, theatrical plays which were essentially designed as ritual theatre meant to confer an initiation awakening on the uh, unsuspecting audience. Um, so that's the one stream. Then the other stream is through this um, self-initiation um, series of handbooks, which he produces. And But he says quite openly, you know, you have to do the work. It's no good just, you know, if you, if you just read through it, it does read almost um, like, I won't say, it doesn't read like nonsense. But it, 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 it's really hard to penetrate. Once you come at it understanding what is meant by it and that you're going to have to sit with this and actually, you know, either do it or, um, you know, decide it's not for you sort of thing, uh, then it starts making sense. Then Peladan also produces his novels, um, which basically perform the same function as the art of the salons. They're kind of objects of it, it, it's I, I coined the term uh literary esotericism um or li yeah uh to talk about this kind of esoteric literature which doesn't just use esoteric themes for decoration uh, or for kind of shock value but whereby by the end once you've finished reading a shift has actually occurred in your thinking it's a reading and engaging with the book itself is almost an act of occult practice simply because you've got to shift your thinking in order to um, fully engage with it and that's kind of what Peladan was trying to do with that. Um, so those are the expressions of his um, Rosicrucian impulse and we see most clearly, I'm going to come back to the handbooks that we'll be tackling in the course, um his th th that's where he really outlines how each person can go off and do this for themselves uh, for themselves um but you're not going to find rituals in paladin you're not going to find formal initiations there are no fireworks or there are no external fireworks and no pins to wear no medals to wear um you see and um it's that form of rosicrucianism where essentially one one is known by um they shall be known by their fruit i think is the <laughs> fruit. um so that's pretty much the story as for lineages that um we mentioned well this is the thing you see there are okay so peladan's lineage starts may start with cagliostro probably doesn't may come through the uh, uh, this prince balbiani of palermo slightly more likely we know it comes through La Paz and Peladan's brother, and that Peladan then initiates to Gaita. But what is this initiation? It simply means that they've understood the process that they need to go through to realize their inner being. That's the initiation. And once they, uh, it, it's, a, it's a gnosis, okay? It's an awakening. And that's it. And that's all it is. Um, and it sounds very small until we actually, <laughs> until somebody actually experiences it. So, um, which of course is something that can't be shared. Um, but as for lineages, what lineages? 
when 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 there is there is no charter you see it's about knowing them by their fruit it's about doing the work it's about um continuing to represent a certain set of ideals and principles um interpreted through one's own unique makeup and that's what Peladon's system allows a lot of space for so again lineages didn't mean anything to Peladan, and he actually says this quite openly and he's got this lovely this one lovely quote you know are you, are you looking to see whether i'm getting this from pythagoras am i borrowing from pythagoras you know why what well, who cares so it was pythagoras the best why don't you be the next pythagoras you be the best the best i can show you how mm. you see so um lineages mean very little to Peladan, and i know several orders several groups that try to trace their lineage through or to Peladan. It doesn't mean a lot. It wouldn't mean a lot to him. And I can say that safely because I can actually go find the quotes <laughs> to support it. So that's not speculation on my part. It doesn't mean an awful lot unless you're doing the work, as far as he's concerned, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, we've done a number of shows on, on Martianism, kind of staying on this topic of Peladon and esoteric orders. Um, what was his connection with, with Martianism? And, and what's a SAR? And like, uh, uh, what do SARs have to do with Martianism? Uh, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, so Peladan, Peladan gets his imagination got, catches on fire with the rediscovery or the discovery, the new archaeological discoveries of a Syrian um, civilization. Okay, which are being shipped to Paris um, in their droves and of course he disapproved of this he was delighted at the opportunity to learn about it but he also thought that um this is very topical actually because the british papers are going on about the elgin marbles which we would like back thank you um <laughs> but um even even peladan said you know very strongly criticized uh colonialism of his day and ripping away parts of civilizations that didn't belong to france so you know, he was woke before woke existed, um, which does not answer your question. Now, uh, <laughs> uh, but where does he get the title Sar from? He claimed that it was the ancient um, Chaldean. He is the word the French would use as an um, to describe the Assyrian uh, civilization. Um, he claimed that it was uh, a, a princely or kingly or even uh, a, so royal or divine title and he assumed it for a time um and he also assumed the name merodach which is one of the deities in the assyrian pantheon now pretentious as this sounds you see calling himself that peladan this actually does connect back to his initiatory system because quite simply, he said, you're going to have to sculpt yourself right now. Your, your soul is just a block of a blank marble. You're going to have to sculpt yourself from the ground up. And because that's going to take a while, again, this is in his initiatory handbook, start acting like you're already the, 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 the being you want to become, even if it hasn't happened yet. Make the acts of faith and the faith will come. And, that, and make your external... Um, both your external appearance and your external um, sort of trappings, so that would include your name, whatever initiatory name you went by, into a work of art. All right. And so for him, Sa Merodak as a title represented all that he hoped to be as a kind of awakener um, and regenerator of society in this life. That's what it represented to him. Now, as far as you are, now this question comes through the question about Martinism. Overall, the Peladan family, and that goes, that includes the father and brother, disapproved of both Freemasonry and Martinism. Um, so for a start, um, you had a lot of, uh, there were political reasons they disapproved of Freemasonry because of the politics of the time and the politics of the Peladan family who were legitimists and wanted the old Bourbon dynasty back on the throne. So very complicated politics at that time and um various other reasons as well we've talked about paladin's and his father's general dislike of anything in structured okay this whole idea of regimentation 
um, and sort of obedience um, and so on it didn't work for Pella Dan certainly because if you couldn't be obedient to your own self what was the point of having someone whipping you into shape okay that's where the, this comes from it sounds like he just couldn't tolerate authority but the deeper philosophical sense is well if you're just falling in line because you're being told to um, and I'm sure everybody out there with any experience of an initiatory sort of more structured setting will recognize that there are always people who just pay lip service and haven't got a clue what they're doing and they're necessary too because it's simply a matter of passing the torch and some will actually wake up to what they're doing some will never wake up and that's okay well for Belladan that wasn't okay and if you couldn't wake up yourself and achieve this by yourself through your own development of self-discipline then there was then there was no damn point pardon my french um that's the one thing and as far as martinism is concerned well the question really comes which martinism um <laughs> okay because there is a strong resemblance actually between peladin's kind of lack of structured anything and saint martin's more loosely organized form of martinism there is um a, a, a resemblance there um but there is uh, and so the, again by the time martinism reaches papus and is turned into a sort of quasi masonic uh format it's kind of it, it's uh, it's already gone for peladan it's gone too far you see um however there are also ideological philosophical differences metaphysical differences in um between peladan's and saint martin's uh, world views um and their perspectives on the nature of the fall and the form um, of reintegration and how that is to occur um as i said peladan's perspective is much more strongly influenced by plato um and so Although the impulse and intentions between, say, Peladan and Saint Martin specifically are quite similar, Peladan's coming at it, the execution of it, comes from a very different direction. Um, now, how do we get SARS floating around? To my knowledge, and I will, I will happily stand corrected on, on this because I didn't go much deeper with this particular line of inquiry. But to my knowledge. Um, Pella, certainly Peladan was uh, in, initially initiated into Papus's system that was for as long as they actually did work together. Um, and so then it's through de Gaeta that some of those elements um, were, or, and if not through de Gaeta, then certainly um, in, the, in, the, the, in the confusion of that period, that some elements of Peladan's um, practice were adopted, became adopted um within this sort of idea of a school of universal occultism um so uh, certainly elements of paladin's thought made it into papus's school and were furthered through that route um and some continued to claim a lineage from paladin but this was never with his blessing so uh and there may have been a line through belgium as well let me not forget belgium um, and through um, Dantin and Berthollet. And so there are other streams through some of his followers um, and successors. But Peladan himself, it, it didn't really, it, it wasn't what he was looking to do at all. So, yeah. Um, a question that I think a lot of people are going to find particularly fascinating because because I've read you know some of your writing on the topic but about can you talk to us about how Peladon impacted your own thought and your own artistic practice hmm. yeah um well as I said much earlier I came to esoteric studies not having a clue who Peladon was um looking to systematize my very, very, very patchy um, knowledge of bits and pieces that I've kind of picked up. Um, but I wanted a visual vocabulary and I wanted a visual vocabulary that meant something. I didn't want to just be, and certainly the, the art school I went to was kind of uh, training us up in a kind of modernist, expressionist um, style, which really didn't do it for me. I wasn't interested in uh, you know focusing on painterly impressions of whatever i wanted my art to mean something i wanted to tell stories and i didn't want it to be focused on me 
um, I, I, a lot of people have sort of said to me, oh, the emotions in this painting. I'm like, there's no emotions in this painting. Well, not they're not my emotions. They're a, a kind of it, me trying to tell a story about something that hopefully is more universal. That's what I really wanted to achieve, you see. Um, and so my route through academia was all kind of tuned towards developing that, le learning that language better. Um, and having art mean something that could touch people. But I wasn't interested in being introspective. Um, and in fact, in the last couple of years, I've become introspective and it's not doing my art any good at all. <laughs> it's, it's become a problem. <laughs> um, but so um, in terms of uh, and in, in terms of uh, how Peladan impacted me, well, he was a ready made system. He was somebody telling me, you know what, art does have this power and giving me a beautifully put together cosmology that I could play with. And do I actually hand on heart believe in his cosmology? I honestly don't have a clue. Um, <laughs> are they incredibly beautiful ideas that resonate and may lead a viewer to inquire, to look a little bit more deeply, to contemplate, to, for a moment, leave the daily plod? Oh, yes. So um, to ask perhaps difficult questions. Oh, yes. Is it a way that I can hide much, much deeper intellectually satisfying um, concepts in plain sight because somebody who doesn't get them isn't going to get them and that's fine. Um, I've had some amusing moments where that's concerned. Yes, it is. Is it incredibly technically elaborate but also a heck of a lot of fun to do? Oh yeah. Okay, so that's really what Peladan gave me as an artist. Um, I wouldn't say that he particularly impacted me um, philosophically, because remember, I'm Greek and um, Plato was already a good friend before, <laughs> um, as, as are the pre-Socratics, in fact. So um, it, was, it, it was very gratifying to kind of discover Paladin's use of that depth of philosophy, but it wasn't new. It was simply, I, I, I saw it repackaged for his time to serve his ends. Um, and that was interesting, um, but that's as far as I'd probably go because alre already I had that background. For somebody who doesn't have that background, though, it's it's a revelation, I would think. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so I've done a lot of projects, uh, art projects, and I haven't really gone deep enough yet simply because life hasn't let me, is the truth. Um, you know, the day job gets in the way. Family illness has been a concern for several years now that has not allowed me to work as, as I would like, but it, you know, life happens. Um, and do I have more that I'm, I hope to do with Paladin's ideas? Yes, I do, <laughs> if time ever allows. Um, but that's pretty much um, what he's given me, I would say. Jason, anything anything in that before I, I power on to the next question? I don't always well, talk about anything about art. So Yeah, yeah I mean, uh, uh, just simply that I would echo what you were saying about um, uh, like finding finding something that spoke to you about the nature of the art you were creating. That like, um, that again, that was kind of my experience with Gnosticism. Um, uh, and like, I never came to Gnosticism as a way away from, or in supplement to any other like spiritualism or or church experience or anything like that. It was literally somebody going like, "Oh, hey, like divine spark, um, like a sense, a, a connection to this like deeper, deeper sense of the world and everything like that." I'm like, "That's it. That's what I'm hearing." And yeah. then, and then the cosmology became. Oh, that's interesting. That's what you call it. Like, so like just the way you said, um, if you're like, if you hand on hard, believe in Peladon's cosmology, mm, who knows, but like, does what he's saying speak to you as an artist? Oh, you know, mm. yeah, so I'm just, I I'm just gushing is basically what I'm doing here. <laughs> I mean, no, but that, that's great because that's really, I think, you know, the sense that I got, and this is something I'd also like to kind of put on record again with reference to sometimes the, quote unquote, practitioner, scholar, misunderstandings. I don't want to call it a debate. It shouldn't be a debate. It's kind of like it was going into 
scholarship that gave me the names for things I couldn't articulate. And that includes what you just said there, you see, because um, it was Peladan's perhaps way of looking at all of this that gave me a vocabulary to understand and, uh, and a conceptual framework to understand this impulse I'd had since I was 14 and couldn't sleep and stayed up at night sketching things. Mm. Um, you know, I, I painted my door one night, I was so bored. I didn't have paintbrushes, I used my fingers. Uh, <laughs> you know, that, that door's still there, my parents loved it, thank God. Um, <laughs> what I painted an androgyne disappearing into a triangular kind of swirling cloud space. Okay, that, that's odd at 14, that's really odd. Um, <laughs> but did I have, it was clumsy, you see, I didn't have words for it. And that's what Peladan gave me. It's what exactly what you just said there. It's like, ah, that's what you call it, you see. Mm. And that, so it gave me a much firmer kind of path to walk on. It's still a lot of work, you know, you still get tired. Mm. Um, but now, you know, it, it, has a, it, has a, it has a shape now. Yeah, and you know, there's something there too about, um, the, the oh that's what you call it because maybe like Peladon's belief that like uh especially the kind of art he was trying to make would like wake people up but uh um there's also maybe a a, a a smaller version of that where I think any any work of art probably of any like from the the most commercial Hollywood blockbuster uh to to the most like to the to, to a weird personal zine of art that you find in a little library somewhere um, might have a moment where you're like, oh, that person describes something I felt before. Mm -hmm. Just that, yeah. that, that tiny little gasp of, oh, oh, that's what you call it. Like, yeah. even if it's of the smallest experience, you know? But that was Peladan. That's what Peladan was saying. We artists should be trying to do. Exactly. And it doesn't matter how small exactly. or big it is. It, it is what it is, but at least you've tried. You know, mm. if you get one person on side, that you've done the job. Exactly. Uh, yeah. So yeah, that's exactly what it is. Hmm. Well, I'm sorry, I, John. Oh, you, you you go now. <laughs> oh well, uh, I was actually going to to change change the subject because there is a question, and of course, you know, this is a topic I would like us to talk about longer. But got to get back into lineage and history because I would be remiss. I would get in trouble. I wouldn't really. But but uh, <laughs> Sasha, I, you know, I have to ask you. But both Jason and I are members of a modern Joanite Joanite church that that traces its its lineages back to Fabre Palaprash. What was, and of course, Peladon's later, but, but what was Peladon's connection to Palaprat or, or Palaprat's uh, Templar order or church? Or what? what is the connection between Palaprat's movements and, uh, and Peladon? It's a question mark. And the sources are extremely, extremely thin on the ground. So you've got a lot of speculation making it in now. There is a claim that Peladan was officially designated Grand Master of Palaprat's uh, Johannite Church um, and so that he served between 1892 and Okay, and um, this affiliation and succession is claimed to have come through his father, Adrian Peladan. But that claim is based on a single statement in the Bulletin in the Croix du Temple Bulletin of the Sovereign and Military Order of the Temple of Jerusalem, published in 1965. Now we know records were lost, we know archives were lost, but so th there's no saying whether this is true. All we have is this one bulletin, and Peladan himself makes one small statement um, regarding his affiliation. To, uh, through his father to um, a stream of neo-Templarism, okay? But that's the only term he uses. So there, this has caused boundless speculation as to, you know, whether it's true, whether it isn't, which stream of neo-Templarism, since there are three streams of neo-Templarism um, around Peladan's time um, and that did, they sort of interconnect with the Toulouse Rosicrucians as well. Um, but firstly, we have the question of which Neo Templarism, and there's been very speculation on this by various scholars um, as to whether it was or wasn't uh, this sort of Palaprat's um, current. Um, 
then there's another point. There's an excellent, quite recent um, piece of research that was done by uh, Daniel Clawson um, in relation to the history of the sovereign and military order of the Temple of Jerusalem. And he's looking at this particular lineage as well. Um, now, he suggests that um, we shouldn't be looking at the sort of political or ideological differences um, that Peladan may have had with Palaprat's order, because there are all sorts of political, again, reasons why it doesn't really stick. Um, since there's no evidence either way, Clawson makes um, an, a fair argument for the idea that Peladan may have acted as regent for the order, since grandmasters are appointed for life. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that Peladan only served, according to Peladan himself, for two years suggests that as the order basically got into trouble and stagnated for quite a while, Paladin kind of received whatever he was meant to receive, eventually passed it on because he was more interested in doing his own thing. And that's about it. Um, Clausen does also demonstrate the involvement of the Belgian Cumris Lodge um, in the continuity of the order of the temple specifically. And because we know that Paladin passed one line of succession of his own order through Cumris via Jean Delville, one of his, the artists he was closest to, there certainly seems to be some involvement there, but there is no reference in Paladin's latest work, later um, work at all, and at least that I've ever seen, and at least two or three others have looked at the same thing. Um, and one of the most thorough histories I've come across by Gerard uh, Galtier, who really looks at some um, uh, sort of high, high, high grade Freemasonry and Rosicrucianism and neo chivalry, neo Templarism in France of that period, um, he comes up blank as well. So um, certainly they drank from the same cups. Certainly there seems to have been some. Why on earth would Pella don't even make that statement, essentially? Then we've got this one little reference in a 1965 bulletin, and that has been taken as license to then run with this as fact, at least by some uh, individuals. There, there are archives that were lost. We don't know, truly. Um, and speculation, you know, can only get us over historic. I'm, I'm not a fan of historical speculation, really. Um, so. I'm afraid that's all I've got. It's not a satisfactory answer, um, but you've got to remember that at the time, let's go back to the context of um, all sorts of organisations and societies and associations springing up. You know, it's a messy time. Exactly. Uh, Peloton seems to be having a, a bit of a comeback. So there was the Guggenheim show that you mentioned. There was a big article on, on Eflux, which is a very popular modern art site. Uh, and, and I've seen him pop up in other places as well that, that weren't uh, particularly related to the esoteric. Why, why now? Um, I have to say the Guggenheim show did Paladin a severe injustice. Um, the ideas, the way the way he's presented, unfortunately, just sort of kind of repeats all the misperceptions that are already out there about Paladin. I actually contacted the curator um, and said this right off the bat. They weren't. They actually told me they weren't interested in Paladin at all, but they were only interested in tracing the artists and their later impact, which I found nonsensical. But there you go. Um, why now? Look. We're living in incredibly uncertain times, and there are issues that we're currently facing, um, global issues, um, geopolitical issues, social issues that have remained unresolved since Paladin's time. Um, taking a sort of grand view of history, it's, uh, you know, a lot of some people are comparing our current times to the 1930s. Um, you could also compare our current times to the 1910s um, for, for a number of uh, reasons. So we're dealing with a lot of uncertainty. The second thing is we're dealing with secularism like never before. Um, I, I, I keep coming back to this because when you rip out the notion of public spirituality 
from a society, any society, um, which in France was kind of done <laughs> overnight, um, then in the rest of Western Europe, or at least in the yeah in the West, rest of Western Europe, was done very gradually over the course of the 20th century. Um, you leave a vacuum. And even people who don't like organized religion ultimately are going to be reaching for something. They're going to be, there's this sense, especially with uh, which generation is it now, Generation Z, you know, there's this sense of, um, you know, this lack of meaning, this need for find for, for some kind of order. Somebody tell us what we're supposed to be doing, you know. Um, so Paladin, why Paladin? He offers this path through art, first of all. He, if, he, I think, validates the idea of meaningful creativity. And he also, in, you know, the, his, his very strictness, the very difficulty of his system, because you do need to be skilled. You can't just, you know, pick up a pen, pencil and do a doodle and suddenly be serving Paladin's purpose. It needs to be skillful. It needs to at least make a fair attempt at being skillful. And that form of kind of self-discipline, the idea of being able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps and have the hope of within this lifetime making some kind of meaningful uh, difference, first to yourself, first it has to be to yourself, um, and then to those around you, you know, it's incredibly attractive, um, I think, in times like these. Now, this part, this uh, part of Peladan's work isn't so widely known um but i think especially because symbolist art was considered so very unfashionable for a time and because conceptual you know conceptual art from the 60s onwards really deconstructed everything into the ground okay we've done all the deconstructing we've broken everything we can break um, maybe now's the time to attempt to build and when where are you going to reach to when you um uh, when everything's rubble, you're going to reach to a time when it looked like something was flowering. When's the earliest that happens? Ah, well, for some, at least, it's actually round about that time. You see, the last time something was close to flowering and is modern enough as well, because Peladan's, uh, Peladan really speaks to sort of the individualism of modernism. He's an early modernist, um, uh, and there's no time that, to be honest. It, it, it speaks to the individual who can be self, um, what's the word, um, self-sufficient, uh, self-aware, but also be part of a collective uh, that actually makes a difference. So I think a lot of that, um, a lot of those reasons, um, and then you've got a generalised sort of interest in occultism um, throughout the mainstream press, which is really odd, or perhaps it isn't odd. People are looking for meaning. People are really looking for something to grasp and a sense of authenticity. And perhaps Paladin offers that. Uh, I certainly think he does. Yeah. Well, we, we do have to start wrapping up. Uh, Jason, you put in a, a fun question about one of your favorite contemporary <laughs> writers. Maybe we can end on yes. that to, 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 I mean, it's all been fun, but uh, it's, it's uh, a good ending point. Great. Well, and I, I will also just even put a little touch on the, on your last uh, note there, Sasha, was that I, I think one of the things that's appealing about, about Peladon as well is that he is somebody who seems to advocate doing the work. So like he, he has, he has a lot of information to give, but um, he's also like, He's he's saying D I'm not a guru. Don't listen to me as your guru. I am not your reincarnated whatever. Do the work, you know, um, which I respect <laughs> a lot more. I think like that's the like I think I think uh, esotericism and spirituality are definitely getting more popular. But the the flip side of that are those groups or people that are offering easy answers. And I think it's great. It's great that someone who's ask who's saying do the work is also kind of getting popular. Um, For how uh, long? <laughs> it's well, hard work. It's that's nice. true. That's true. Um, but yes, yeah, so yeah, one of my favorite writers uh, is a guy named Alan Moore, comic book writer, um, the guy who created The Watchmen, uh, along with Dave Gibbons and a lot of other great comics like um, From Hell with uh, Eddie Campbell and The League of Extraordinary Gentlemen with Kevin O'Neill. Um, uh, a lot of these were also turned into movies that weren't nearly as good as the comics. <laughs> um, 
he's also a huge esotericist. He did a whole comic about uh, going up the, the the Kabbalah tree of life. He also loves art, uh, and he believes magic and art are the same thing. He's got a great beard um, and a great hair. Uh, he's done salons. Is he the reincarnation of Peladon is basically my question. <laughs> um, no, he's not the reincarnation of Peladon. <laughs> Peladon doesn't, hasn't got reincarnation, but he's <laughs> the descendant of one of those angels, just like mm, Peladon, yes. just like any artist who lives, who walks the talk. Totally. Any artist that walks the talk. And Alan Moore is a prime example of an artist that walks the talk. Um, you know, it's amazing. One of the exhibitions that I told you that I did for the Peladan Project was at a conference in Northampton, the University of Northampton, where Alan oh. Moore was the keynote speaker. Uh, Trans States oh. Conference, number one, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, boom, exactly. And yeah. that's one where I lost my slides and I had to stand up and riff. My talk was about the fallen angels. I had to stand up and oh. riff. <laughs> it's on camera it's on youtube um but it, is alan moore the reincarnation of paladin i don't think so but i think he is an absolute archetype and epitome of everything paladin was saying and he's totally he's, and is he the descendant of a fallen angel who is waiting for us to wake up so they can go back upstairs with us well wouldn't it be nice to think so <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Oh, yeah. Responsibility, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> and I honestly, I think he'd probably agree with like, well, I don't know, but I sure wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, it's it's been a, a really amazing show, and obviously we could go longer, but we we do have to say goodbye. It's uh, very late for Sasha. Is <laughs> um, uh, yeah. Oh, so God. thanks for staying up so late to, to do this long, fascinating show with us. And thanks for going long as well, because it's so late where you are. Because we really wanted to ask all these questions. So and really get into his, his thought and his life. Um, so we're going to put all the links uh, in the, the show notes. We've been flashing them up on the screen. Everybody go to the TreadwellsLondon.com website. That's TreadwellsLondon.com slash events. And uh, take Sasha's course, buy her books, uh, uh, read her writings. Well, actually, I guess I uh, we We'll put everything in there, but but I should mention, you know, I drew some of the questions. I mentioned reading some of your writing, but our friends over at, at pansofers.com, you're sort of doing a, as you mentioned at the beginning, you're sort of teaming up with them to do, to continue the, the Peladon project, right? That's right, so, yes. Yeah. Um, so people can go to pansofers.com and read read your work there on, on Peladon? Um, they, yeah, I'm uh, transferring... Um, some older material so that um, it will be all have it all in one place because I'm notoriously disorganized with my website so that's <laughs> all in one nice place for the people who really want it and also doing some dedicated blog posts just for the, the, so it's the Paladin Project at pansofers.com and there's also a Facebook group for those wanting to explore Rosicrucianism in general um, which again is the sort of community side of Pansifers. Um People can find it and ask questions, and they're a very, very friendly bunch. Anyway. <laughs> awesome. Well, my name's Deacon Jonathan Stewart, and I'm signing off. Bye, everybody. This is Jason. Bye bye. Bye bye, and thank you very much.